Hey, welcome, 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 everybody. How are you doing this evening? Praise the Lord. Amen. Boy, I got a lot of messages today. I want to thank you all for reaching out to me via inbox, as well as those of you who posted hellos and bless yous and those types of things, um, or your affirmation of the Word of God. Amen. In today's program, thank you so much as well. <laughs> so tonight, let's get back in this word. We left off in Exodus. Um, we we're talking about the Passover and how um, how just well, first of all, it's point in history, and then how important it is and how pertinent it was to understanding everything that was going on with Christ, that He is the Passover Lamb, that everything done in this time was a type and a shadow. Everything done was done for our admonition, for our understanding, but it was also done to lay a, a, a foundation for when God began to reveal himself at even higher heights and greater levels for each and every one of us. So thank you once again for joining. Um, we're in Exodus. Praise God. We're going to get in this word. And then we're going to hear from the Lord and, and see what God is telling us. So we can understand more and more about our relationship. Sometimes we look at, you know, the Old Testament books, especially the first five, the, Pente um, the Pentateuch or the Torah. People look at those and they say, oh, you know, that's the Old Testament. That's the law. We're no longer under the law. But there is much that is written during this time. And this is pre-law, by the way. Um, there's much that is written during this time that reveals to us or helps us to understand what God is saying said was saying to us in the New Testament days, in the days of the early church, as well as in the day of the current church. Praise God and what God is doing and wants to do and how he can do it. Amen. In our lives now. It's amazing. You know, the man who understands where he came from, amen, is the man who will successfully reach where he is going. You know, um, if you don't know where you came from, if you don't have a sense, it's just harder to learn. It's harder to learn. It's all new to you. You know, when, if we can have an understanding of where we came from, it kind of gives us some clarity and some understanding as to why things are the way they are, how to walk out a process or, you know, what does it mean to, um, you know, when someone says, oh, but this is what God says, well, is that really necessary? And the answer is, yes, it really is. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's so often, it's so much that we put to the side and we, you know, we say, mm. You know what God said, but I was thinking. You know, and the children of Israel, they 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 had it hard. I mean, you know, they really did in their relationship with God because this was a case where God said, and what you were thinking could get you killed. <laughs> it could bring your life to a rapid end. You know, the children of um, the people in Egypt, they were not God's chosen people at the time. So, you know, fortunately, God now has opened up the doors, amen, to, to salvation. And the, we are the part of the whosoever will. Amen. If you have faith to believe, then you have, amen, the, then you shall receive salvation. Interestingly enough, the very people that were his chosen people, they are the people whose father, amen, is the father of faith. He is the one who spoke, who, who heard God and moved out upon the word of the voice of the Lord only, trusting and believing that the voice that he heard was the true and living and only God. He came from a monotheistic, from a um, polytheistic society into a monotheistic society, meaning from many gods to just one. And trusting that just one so much that he packed up all of his family and everyone that worked for him at the time and his nephew and moved across the country, Right? To then this is I'm talking about Abraham and moved the, across the country to this place called Canaan that the Lord said now this is your land this is your promised land you know in the beginning here we, of um, Exodus we found the children of Israel they found themselves Lord got stuck I was saying Goshen <laughs> Amen they went to find I, I kind of wonder though I wonder and I and I'm actually gonna ask God it. If so, if you know, if there is ever an opportunity to sit down and get an understanding of all these things, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day. I would say, you know, the word says that we shall be all knowing, we shall be like him. So there's some things I want to know. 
not that they matter, just that they would add to my understanding of the Word of God. You know, when you pose all of these interesting answers, but some of the questions I found in my in my recent network, you know, we po I posed a few questions, particularly about this segment. You know, it's like, well, during the, here, here's, here's an example. During the time that the children of Israel were in Goshen, did God ever speak to them and tell them it was time to leave and they just didn't go? And they ended up stuck. <clears throat> I ask that because, think about it in, in when they were in the wilderness. God spoke to them. They didn't leave. And they ended up stuck for 40 more years. I just wonder. Things that make you go, hmm, right? Okay. So last night we ended this lesson. We ended our lesson in verse number... <laughs> we ended up in chapter 12 and... Find the scripture, girl. I think it's 14. Oh, no. Nope. In verse 11. <laughs> Amen. So we ended up, we ended up closing in um, verse 11. And then I think I picked up again and went through verse number 13. What does that translate into? Basically, God has walked them through the, through the, um, telling them how to choose a lamb, what the lamb should look like, that it should be less than a year old, that it should be, um, that it should be a year, a year old or less, um, without spot or without blemish. Um, it could be a goat or an actual, you know, a sheep, a uh, small, a lamb, the baby of a, a sheep. It could be either one, um, that it had to be fully roasted. Right in the head and the legs, the head and the legs were to be roasted together, and then the rest of the body was to be was to be cooked together, roasted together by itself. Um, that it was to be eaten by all. It was to be totally and completely consumed. Right, according to the Jewish history, that meant that you know, for a lamb, that would be a household of ten, amen, and no more than twenty. And if you didn't have enough, you were supposed to. If you didn't have enough people in your family to consume um, all of this food, all of this lamb, the lamb, the unleavened bread, amen, if you didn't have enough to consume that, then you were to invite someone else in another family, and the two of you would join together, or the three of you, however, however many it was, especially if you have a few older couples, you know, it could be hard to eat a whole lamb, <laughs> You know, it could be hard to eat a whole lamb. You know, you would hope for some teenage boys to go ahead and bump knock that off for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, they were supposed to consume the entire lamb. And they weren't to be sitting down. They were to be dressed um, with staff and shoes and ready to go. And while they were inside building their faith, then, you know, and following the, and obeying God, while they were inside obeying God, outside, Amen. The Lord was wreaking havoc in um, in Egypt. The that night, the first the death angel passed through the city. The Lord passed through the city, and the firstborn of every household that was not covered under the blood, praise God, was consumed. But God promised the children of Israel. He says, when He sees the blood, He'll pass over. He won't come through that door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I love, I love this, and I want to say this tonight to, to, to everybody, amen, including me, that you do in the house, in your pride, in this house, what God is calling you to do, that's what you do. You obey God. You pray, you fast, you study, you surrender to the word, you, you know, do the things that he's called you to do. If he's called you to write songs, write books, you know, make clothes, do whatever. You do what he's called you to do. Because while you're on the inside, being obedient, while you're listening to the voice of God in total surrender, right, and doing that which he said for you to do, while you're doing that, he's on the outside, 
praise God, working things out on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Just got that tonight. So as we see, as we see the glory of God and the hand of God at work, there's a lot that we just need to absorb and say yes to the Lord about, right? Amen. So now he's come through and he's given them this promise. It says, then he talks to them. The next thing he talks to them about is what does work, what, what is worship going to look like as they move forward? I want us to pick up, um, hmm. Okay, we left off in verse 11. We're not going to read every scripture, but we're going to read a lot of them. <laughs> we're going to read a lot of them. Okay. For this day, for this, verse number 12, it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And it says, And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Mm. <laughs> he said, Against all the gods of Egypt, amen, I will execute judgment. That meant that God knew that they were worshiping other gods. He saw that and he recognized that. And whatever spirit that was, it's not just a statue, but it's a demonic force behind that. Whatever spirit that was, God wreaked havoc on them that night. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God that he came through the city. It says, and this is the day, he says, and this day shall be for a memorial, and ye shall keep it as a feast unto the Lord throughout your generations. Amen. We, that means that they're to, they're to celebrate the Passover. Amen. And that we know that of the Jewish holidays, one of their primary holidays is what? The Passover. Right? Amen. And so we're to celebrate it as believers as well. Because we know that the that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, amen, which was slain before the foundation of the world, amen, came back into the world as the Son of God and God. And he was slain for the sins of all of mankind. He was. He is. Our sacrifice, he is our lamb. Amen. And because of his blood that was shed, praise God, and the overcoming and over over transformational power, um, the resurrection power, better yet, amen, that was in him. He rose again, praise God, and just took captivity captive, amen, and gave gifts unto men. He said, now, I can use y'all now, <laughs> right? Why? Because the thing that was stopping us, that was impeding our progress in regard to growing in God was the enemy, was the challenges that we were battling in the enemy. But the Lord put a stop to that with Jesus. And then Jesus said, now, here are more gifts. Think about the gifts, though. I mean, the gifts of God are amazing, and they are, they are without repentance, too. I mean, he doesn't change his mind. <laughs> he said, this is the gift I gave it to him to grow with it. <laughs> Amen. It's going to bring her closer to me. Now, everybody isn't using the gifts like God called for them to do, but some, most of us are. Amen. And so, he now, picture this, that Jesus went and knocked down every plan, every trick, every deception of the enemy on our behalf. That's what this night was all about. That even looking hindsight, the Lord delivered them with the blood of lambs. Right? But he has delivered mankind with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his very own son. Amen. The third essence. Amen. The, ver the third presence of God in the Godhead. Now, you all know that I believe that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Amen. One Father, one Son, and one Holy Spirit. But these three are manifest in one. Praise God. So we know that I believe that. I don't believe um, in three unique individual, totally to themselves entities. That's why when God's voice speaks, he says it sounds like many waters because it's, it, it's the world with all of us talk together. Amen. See, the Godhead is one voice. Amen. One presence, one power. And in that, in the Godhead, we have the father, amen, the spirit and his son, or even as, as he's called the lamb. Amen. This lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. Amen. And then the manifestation of it comes in the first Passover, which is what we've discovered just here. Now, what happens after Passover? The Lord says, I will pass over you. Um, what, what are we to do next? What were they to do next? And I, I love the next. I love the next. Get the next, guys. Get the next. And I know y'all say I love everything. True. It's the word. It's God. Praise him. Amen. Especially something I understand. I really love it. <laughs> 
<laughs> amen. Something that God from reveals. Amen. We ought to love God's word. Amen. Amen. Um, he says this. What is next? He says, what? This day shall be unto you a memorial. Meaning, mark it down on your calendars. It says, keep it as a feast to the Lord. Amen. Throughout all your generations. So shall you keep it as a feast by ordinance forever. This is the feast of the Lord right here. Right? So now they're keeping Passover as the feast. This is the, this is the night that the Lord passed over us. Amen. The story that they would pass down to their children and their children's children and children's children's children to generations and generations to come. Next, he says this. He says this now. He says, keep it as an ordinance. What should it look like? It says, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. It says, even the first day ye shall put all leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread... Um, from the first day until the seventh day, the soul shall be cut off from Israel. Mm. The soul shall be cut off. Not just their person, not just them. Their soul shall be cut off from Israel. What does that say to you? If God tells you that someone's soul is cut off from Israel, amen, the soul is cut off. Not just the person, the soul. I believe this. There's a, there was a promise given. And when God gave the promise to the children of Israel, he not only promised one individual, he promised it to generation after generation after generation in that person's bloodline. So what he's telling me, he says, if you don't obey me, I'm going to disconnect from you and your family. <laughs> I'm going to disconnect you and your, 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 your family. Everybody connected to you now gets disconnected. See, the children of Israel, y'all, that, that first set of believers... Amen. They had it hard. Thank God for grace. Ah. Ooh, Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for grace. <laughs> Amen. But they had it hard. But I, the Lord knew what he was doing. The Father knew. He knew what it was going to take to establish, amen, the faith in the hearts of the men, such that it would pass from generation to generation to generation. You let God tell you so that your soul will be cut off from somewhere. <laughs> you know, people risk hell every day by deliberately committing sin. Say, oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, we do. We do. Not that we, you know, God have mercy on us. His, if it wasn't for the mercy and grace of God, amen, none of us would make it in. Thank God for the, for the power and the resurrection power of Jesus that he has the blood, that in the blood, amen, he washes us of, of our sins. He's, the word of God says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank God for the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Even, you know, the blood of the lamb here. Thank God for that. So let's get back to what happens. <laughs> Amen. After they, they experience Passover. The Lord says you're going to go on a seven day consecration. Amen. That seven days, it shall be a holy convocation. All right, now, it says, and in these seven days, you shall have no manner of, um, that you shouldn't have any leavened bread in your house. Amen. It says, and in the first day of, the, of this day shall be a holy consecrate convocation, verse number 16. It says, and in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them. Save that which every man must eat. Let's see. That only may done may be done of you. Which means you can only eat on that day and you can only prepare food, basically. This is and ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Oh look at this. This is the feast of unleavened bread. It's the announcement of the feast of the unleavened bread. Amen. Stop. Alright. This is for in this for in the self same day. It says, I have brought, I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall I observe, shall ye observe in this day in your generations of the, of this ordinance forever. So right after, praise God. Hey, my sister. Hi, hi Dr. Kai. <laughs> praise God. Welcome. So in the seventh day, for the first seven days, you're on, you're on a fast, basically. And you're having unleavened bread and nothing with leaven in it. Following that, following the um, following that you're now going to there's a convocation unto God, Amen. And it's and it's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
Amen. And so in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's for our soul. It says, now choose me. Choose me just like I chose you. You know, I've shown you favor. I've given you deliverance. I've given you a new life. Now I want you to turn around and choose me. For us, by grace, amen, God allows us to stay in the kingdom. For them, they were subject to be cut off and lost forever. You know, in the, in the earth, I, I, God knew when I needed to be born. How about you? <laughs> amen. Did God not know when we needed to arrive on the scene? Amen. I need grace. Amen. We need grace. But here, this is the law. And when he's giving out the law, now he's setting in place the feast, the holy feast. He says, remember the Passover. And next it says, remember the, um, the feast of unleavened, unleavened bread. It says, for in the selfsame day that I brought out the armies of Egypt, brought out the armies out of the land of Egypt, therefore shall ye observe in that day the generations by the generations this ordinance forever. So God is establishing for them what is going to be their ordinances, these the holy days, right? of the children of Israel are being established at this very moment. They weren't even in the wilderness when this was established. Now, they were, they arrive in the wilderness and they practice it. Praise God. Welcome, Sister Diane. Um, they practice it in the wilderness, but the ordinance given for it was given in Egypt before they ever came out, before they ever got in the place where they could now um, serve God, worship God, do the work that he had called them to do. God was telling them what was to be done. See, when God is talking to us, and I want you guys to pay attention to this, when God is talking to us about whatever the topic is, amen, whether it's our next level, our next move, amen, or whatever's going on in our life right now, right, he's telling us in advance what he wants us to do next. You know, we sometimes we move too quickly when God is speaking to us. Amen. Sometimes we move too quickly. Sometimes God, he's, he's telling you now what he wants you to do next. But he won't, we, we wait until we think that God is telling us in that very moment. Do this right now. And the reality is he never sends us anywhere unprepared. He always prepares us so that when you get there and the test comes or the opportunity to execute that which he called you to do, comes, you are not unprepared. I mean, God told them, he said, listen, he says, after this, these, this is, this is the plan. This is the word. After this, seven days, no, no leaving. At the risk of, to show you that he means what he says, if you have leaven under this, in those seven days, then you're going to be cut off. On the seventh day, it's a convocation unto, unto God. And then there's a convocation unto you, which means that this is the time that you worship the Lord personally. That it's not just about this big congregation, but it's about one-on-one, -on -one, you and God. Next, he says, he says and this is the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. How awesome. He says, finally, he says, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, even, um, it says, at even, at evening, Ye shall eat unleavened. You shall eat unleavened bread until one, and the twentieth, the twentieth day of the month. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your house. Like consecrate. Don't let any sin be found in your house. You know, turn your, in this case, turn your television, your internet off. Amen. <laughs> use it only as required. <laughs> if they, if that's, if that's where we're kind of the, the discussion for this time. We, they, you know, God is speaking to what they had then, but we have to speak to what we have now. Amen. He said, don't have anything deliberately in front of you that represents sin. Because sin, the leaven, it says leaven leavens the whole loaf, which means that if there's a little bit of sin, it makes everything nasty. You know, it grows unclean, and the Lord wants us to be clean. Amen? So he says, whatever it is, just, just the littlest thing. If you know that you're distracted from the Lord through the Internet, then take a consecration. If you know that you're distracted through the Lord through the music that you listen to, then separate yourself from that music. Whatever is separating you from God, doing a complication that you have with him, it means that it doesn't say that you have to choose this every day. What he says is during this time, 
then make the decision to separate yourself from it. It could save your soul. That's right here in Exodus chapter 12. He was telling them this in Exodus chapter 12. And they're still in Egypt. <laughs> Look at God. Look at him right there. The lessons that we live by today were born in this word. Praise the Lord. Welcome, my sister. Good evening. All right. So we are in um, verse number verse number 19. It says, Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever you use leaven. It says, Even unto that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. It says, Ye shall eat nothing leaven. It says, In all of your habitations ye shall eat unleavened bread. Apparently, God is serious about this leaven. He's serious about yeast. He's serious about sin because we know that yeast is a, um, is a type. Amen. Or is, yeah, see, <laughs> about sin. It's a type of sin because you know what happens with yeast? Yeast, you can put it in just a little in a piece of dough and it just grows. It just festers and it splits and splits and splits and it grows. And you know what? It's full of nothing because yeast makes air bubbles. It looks like a big something, but it's a nothing. It's that same little thing that was there before. Amen. God's not into perpetrating. Gotta love him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's a conversation we had. It's good. Amen. Amen. So now verse number 21. Before I leave that, I want I just want to go back over one thing. It's that this. It says, there are five laws concerning seven days that I want to point out to you. God in this number seven and laws pertaining to seven days are important. And they're important and they're transformational. Now, I believe, amen, I believe, and I even share with others that I believe there's, you know, and of course the uh, theologians around the world believe this and for thousands of years believe it and have said it. It's like there are key numbers that are significant in the word of God, but that can be transformational in our own lives, right? And one of those key numbers is the number three, the number um, five, the number seven, the number 10, the number 12. There are five laws in the word, praise God, that tie to five, um, seven day consecrations. And each one of these five laws that come to us, all of them originate in the book of Exodus. How about that? <laughs> Amen. All of them originate in the book of Exodus. And these five laws, right, are transformational for mankind. One, the holy convocation on the seventh day of the feast. That is what we just talked about. It's the feast of unleavened bread. Amen. And then it says, then we have the, the seventh day um, the establishing the Sabbath day. Amen. That's in Exodus chapter 13. And it says, and then um, gather no manna, something else significant that God spoke to them pertaining to the seventh day. And that's in Exodus chapter 16 while they're in the wilderness. And to rest, the seventh day the Lord rested. And then he tells mankind to rest from our labors, from our studies, from our works on the seventh day. It says, and um, it is the Sabbath only for Israel in the land that it is a Sabbath for Israel only in the land and under the law. So there's a Sabbath, there's something specific about celebrating that Sabbath day, amen, for the, for the children of Israel. And I believe that it's beneficial to each and every one of us as well. Have you ever found that, like, if you have a cold, a cold lasts a, a a cold gets bad on the third day, it kind of wraps itself up about the fifth or sixth day, and on the seventh day you feel totally better. <laughs> that's just a regular cold. That's not the flu. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's just the way some things cycle. They cycle in that seven-day period. And if you think about it for yourself, how many of us have done, I'm doing a seven-day fast. And at the end of the seventh day, you find new strength. At the end of the seventh day, you find new vision. At the end of the seventh day, you find new wisdom. You find the answer to whatever it was you were looking for. At the end of the seventh day, you find new clarity. 
If you're ever in a bind, you're ever in just a place where you don't have wisdom, you don't have direction, you're reading the words, you're praying, you're listening to sermons, and nothing is working, it's time to go on a fast. It's time to go on a fast, and it's time to fast away from leaven. Whether the, whether the fast is food or whatever, it, it may just be the input of substance, stuff that has no substance. Air. Conversations that don't really need to happen. It's time to, it's time to fast away from those types of things. Things that add no substance as it pertains to your relationship with God. Whatever the leaven is in your life for seven days, sit it aside. And dedicate that time solely to the Lord. And during that time, you will have substance when you return. You won't have a piece of dough that's full of air that just looks big, but when you touch it, there's nothing there. It's that same little piece from before. And, you know, right after leaven, just, just I don't know how many of you bake bread or, or understand the, the concept of rising yeast, but if, if you let yeast rise, if, if you wait too long, it'll rise past its capacity and it'll fall. It'll just, it's like a souffle that just looks like so much dessert when it's really just really about that much. You know, it, it's really about one-fifth of what you see. And, but if you let it rise too long, what does it do? It falls. Because... All that is is air. It falls in on itself. There's no substance there to hold it. That's why the Lord tells us to separate our things from ourselves from things that have no substance, things that have no benefit, things that are unclean, things that give the appearance of but are not. Amen. Amen. So let's um, let's see. <clears throat> I want to close out tonight with this. It says in verse number twenty nine. It moved, the scripture moves on, and it's, this is where he said that he was going to pass through the city that night. And this is exactly what he does. He passes through the city with a vengeance. <laughs> Amen. That night, and the firstborn of everything that was in the land of Egypt, the Lord smote. The firstborn, from the firstborn of Pharaoh at, that sat on the throne to, to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and the firstborn of cattle. Hmm. Amen. The Lord killed the firstborn of all of those. And it says, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants, and the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not one house where there was not at least one dead. And it says, And he called, you know, Pharaoh called Moses, because Moses had told him. It's like, the Lord is coming. Amen. It says, He called for Moses and Aaron that night and said, Rise up. And get, you know, get you and your people from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go and serve your God as you have said. He says, also take your flocks and your herds. Um, he says, take all your stuff. Verse number 32, he says, also take your flocks and your herds. And as ye, as ye have said, and be gone. And um, bless me also. Pharaoh asked him, he's throwing them out. He said, yeah, but pray for me. Watch over me as well. Pray over me as well. Also take your flocks and your herds that you have said and be gone and bless me also. Amen. That's verse number 32. It says, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land with haste. And they said, um, we be all dead men. Mm. It says, and the people took their, um, and the people took their dough before it was leavened. It says, their kneading, their kneading troughs being bound up with their clothes and put it up on their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the words of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels um, of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor from in the sight of the Egyptians, so that um, they lent unto them as such things that they had required. And they... And they spoiled the the Egyptians. So, message in this is this is what when the Lord tells you to go, Amen. Sometimes we in churches and and I say this to some of my ministers and some of my brothers and sisters in Christ, Amen. You've experienced situations where you've been in a church and you feel pushed out, or you've been on a job and you felt pushed out, and it was just like why why are they push? Look, I will give you a reference. You just it's been nice. We're just going to have to say, you're just not a fit, <laughs> you know, or something like that. And you, or you felt pushed out, you know, 
it was because it was your time to go. The, the, it was the children of Israel's time to go. Their being present in Egypt, the Egyptians felt like because you are still here, amen, you are now causing us to fail. We're, so we're experiencing pressure, and you're over here being blessed. You know, you're coming back and forward to your job and you're talking about how the Lord is blessing you and multiplying your faith. And, you know, he's giving you favor with the bank. Now you have a new house and, you know, and you, you bought the house at a discount or you got favor with your car and, you know, you got a new car or God did something good for the one that you can currently drive. And, you know, he's giving you favor with your family and, you know, the purpose that you work for is going through a divorce. You know, they having problems with their children and your children are being multiplied and blessed over here. You know, that type of thing. So, you know, we come in and we talk about how good God is. Hallelujah. And he is good. How good God is. And then what happens? The people that are around us that don't serve God, they may not be experiencing the same thing. So they start to push you out. They want to push you out. They want you to go. Same thing in church. You know, you get up and you minister and you're anointed and the glory of God is falling and lives are being touched and people are being transformed and all of a sudden ministers are mad at you. Or the person that's over the head of your department is upset with you because you prayed for somebody on the phone or because you led someone, you know, you led someone to Christ or you tell them how your kids or God's using them or he's using your friends or whatever or how's using you on your job or it's just anything. You know, how he's bringing peace to your household. And that person, because they are outside of God, they are doing what? Pushing. But where, what are, are they really outside? Because they're really being used by God. The Egyptians were used by God. I mean, the, it's, I love here at the very end, Pharaoh asked them what? He said, and bless me. Remember that the, the blessing that went on between, um, what's his name? Jacob and his uncle. Right, so the blessing was, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. In that case, that's, that's you know, that's, we say that at the end of church, right? May the Lord watch between me and thee, while, Jacob and Laban, while we're absent one from another. Amen. Do you know that that's what the enemies say to each other? It's like, bless you. Keep it moving. <laughs> It is. It's. It's. You know. If you. If you. Let's study the culture. The. The blessing is to say. You know. Okay. We are leaving each other in peace. Don't come back this way, and I won't come your way. So when he tells him to bless him, he's saying, "Look." He said, "Leave me in peace. Leave me in peace. Let my people stop. Whatever is whoever the God is you serve, stop killing my folks. Leave me in peace. Right." And so, and that's why, you know, people wonder, it's like, how could Pharaoh turn around and turn around on his word and then go chase the children of Israel like he's going to kill them? Because when he said, leave me in peace, the children of Israel did leave them in peace. But now his burning struggle here is that he's seen devastation.